My time in Australia has been everything I hoped and dreamed it could be, but all good things must come to an end and it's time to fly back to Canada. My first flight is 13 and a half hours before I learn that Vancouver Airport has shut down for snowpocalypse. After some number of hours in the air, I find my way to the Calgary International Airport, not even knowing what day of the week it is. I've seen my fair share of cold weather, but I have to say, flying from plus 30 on the beach to minus 43 is a little bit of a shock. My buddy Brendan left his car at the airport for me, and I've gotta say he's pretty trusting. First time driving on the wrong side of the road in a while. Welcome back to Canada. Good morning, everyone. It is the next day. I slept like a rock last night, and I've just come outside to say hello to an old friend. You'll be happy to know it's warmed up immensely because the sun is out. Now it's only minus 29. <laughs> and you can hear how loud the snow is because of how cold it is. Oh my God, and there she is. <laughs> it's a blast from the past. Check this out. <laughs> So uh, it's actually been in a garage for the whole time, for a year and a half, but my friend Brendan, he did me a super solid because he knew it was going to be so cold, he got it out of the garage a few nights ago. So he swapped on, these are brand new winter tyres, I've never even seen these before. These are Yokohama Geo 75s, so these are really high, uh, super grip winter tyres, you can see, look how many, those squiggly lines on there, we call those sipes. They, uh, they determine how grippy they are basically in the snow. They're not studded, but they're basically as high end as you can go before you go studded. And because they're only two 6'5", 17s, they're about 15 millimeters lower than the XATs that were on it, the summer tires. So that lowered the back. Brendan said they had a couple of guys jump on the back bumper and they drove it out of the garage. So, <laughs> wow, this is, uh, this is strange to see. I just haven't seen it in so long. It's only been outside for a couple of days, but obviously it's been snowing a bit. Can't really see much because it's covered in a bit of snow. But I do have a mission today, more than just coming out here to reminisce. The door's unlocked, so the battery can't be too dead. We have a sneaking suspicion that the battery is flat. And it's kind of hard to say because there is that kill switch that I installed, which Brendan isn't super familiar with. And so he had a bit of a hard time starting it, but it's hard to say if that's because of the kill switch or because the battery is dead. <laughs> this is like putting on an old cozy sweater or a nice comfy pair of socks. Wow, I've spent some hours sitting in this driving seat and uh, wow, it all uh, feels a lot kind of older and different than the Gladiator did. But to see there, it's 290,000 kilometers on the clock. I couldn't really remember and still got some good dust on it. Some of that might be from Africa, just about. And uh, oh yeah, Brendan managed to get two of the summer tires in the back. You can see one, two, that fills up the back pretty well. And wow, I can hardly even remember all the stuff I left in here. Here's a ratchet strap that we used to compress the suspension to get it in. The air hose, because we had to air down and up the tires. But uh, wow, I'd kind of forgotten how worn some of it is. I guess, I mean, it's not a brand new vehicle like the Gladiator was. So <laughs> it's got a few miles on her. But the purpose of today's little expedition, I'm not actually gonna drive anywhere. I don't think I need to. I really just wanna see if it'll start. And because it is minus 30 and it's not plugged in, starting it is not brilliant for it, but I kind of need to know if the battery is dead or not. And when I say plugged in, because this is Canadian spec, it actually has a kettle inside the engine block. There's just an electric heating element, just like your kettle. And when you plug it in to wall power, it heats the coolant that's inside the engine. And because of the heat, it would move around a little bit. That just helps the engine be a little bit warmer. So when you turn the key, you're not doing as much wear and tear to the engine because it isn't actually at minus 30. Maybe it's only at like minus 10 or something like that. Um, but let's see, I guess I have to figure out because if the battery's dead, one of my missions here today in the next couple of days, I better go and get a new battery and make sure that I can actually drive this thing. So, 
If it starts, I'll probably just turn it off again right away because I don't actually need to go anywhere. But if it sounds like the battery is dead, I'll um, come up with a plan on that. Wow. Clutch feels really soft. Okay. I don't know if you guys could hear that, but I could. So it did turn over on the starter. I could hear it but clearly symptoms of a dead battery. It was really whirring and really sounded like loading up, which part of that will just be because the engine's so cold. Kind of confirms to me though, I think I better go and get a new battery. I mean, I need it to go for this whole winter, so why mess around with a battery that maybe is a little bit uncertain? So that's, I think that's my mission for right now. Now I know the battery needs replacing. I think that's gonna be my day to day and uh, Reminisce a little bit. Oh, there's Sid the Sloth hanging off the roll bar. Hey, buddy, I haven't seen you in a while. Jeez, look at him hanging back there. Oh, let's turn that on so I can see. There he is. Hey, buddy. He hasn't done much swinging lately. We better fix that today or tomorrow. Get him swinging around. The shovel's in the back here. I do feel like I left my old hiking boots in here too. I better have a look for them. <laughs> and the old spirit bubble that I put up here to make sure it was level when I park it. I can't actually see if there's a... Oh, it is the bubble. Oh, I wonder if it's frozen. <laughs> this is... This is pretty entertaining. Thanks for coming along, Nostalgia, for me. Let's go find a new battery, and hopefully I can get it in while the sun's still out, so I don't actually freeze. So there we go, we have a new battery on board. I'm in Brendan's car and uh, I got an Optima yellow top because of the dual battery holder in the Jeep. Only an Optima yellow top will fit. So that is a $395 battery, thank you. And I'm sure the house battery is dead as well, so I probably need two of them, but I'll deal with that another day. I'll change that out when it's not minus 29 outside. I'll show you what the driving looks like a bit around town. And uh, it's pretty funny then in Canadian tire. Maybe I don't sound like I'm from here, I don't know. The guy started trying to lecture me about cold weather, you have to plug your car in and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I, I know man, I live in the Yukon, but he still didn't believe me. I guess my accent's a lot stronger now. Everyone in the shop sounded very Canadian. And of course, every single person in there is buying a battery because of the cold weather, everyone's batteries died. So onwards and onwards. There we go. <laughs> this, is, this is just so strange to see. It's all weird memories and feels like deja vu. But uh, I guess I didn't clean it too well before I put it away. Sorry girl, I forgot Brendan and I went for a big drive the day before we put it away. So there are some pretty good bug splatters on here. <laughs> and the engine bay hasn't had a wash for a while, I guess. But uh, here's my challenge for the day. Top battery is the starter. I won't have too much trouble getting off the positive and negative. They're easy enough. Actually, while I was away, I hotwired my solenoid. This is both batteries are bridged together. I'll take that off. I'll disconnect the solenoid entirely so that it does not try to bridge them. And then getting the battery tray out, I remember, is a bit hard. This side is easy. I can get uh, wrenches under here under these guys. But there's one here in the middle, and I remember this one's hard to reach. I mean, it's just going to be a game of perseverance. I'm sure I'll get it out. But uh, I'll dig out the block heater plug-in and see if I've got enough cables to reach. From here, I'm not sure, but if I could get plugged in, that would be great. Two hours later. So as you could have guessed, of course, I froze the GoPro and it totally wouldn't work at all. But it took me, oh, maybe an hour and a half and I did get the new battery fully installed. So you can see there it is there. And uh, the Jeep's been on the block heater, has been plugged in now for probably two, nearly three hours. So certainly the coolant inside the engine well, it shouldn't be at minus 30 anyway, which is good. 
and I've also got the battery right now plugged into um, a battery charger. So I just thought it'd be a good idea to try and get that new battery as strong as it can possibly be. So oh yeah, I'll show you this too. This is the block heater here, factory installed from Jeep. This was always in the Jeep. And so it goes down into a Welsh plug down on the side of the engine. Um, and the whole job went pretty well. The worst part was actually these holes in my little gloves that I have. Every time my finger touched metal, basically I lost feeling. And uh, by the time I was finished, I couldn't feel my fingers or toes. That's how it goes. So let me just disconnect this stuff and then we'll see how she goes. So let's see what happens here. If it won't start now, I don't think it'll start at all. Let's try. There it goes. All right, so it fired up really strong. The battery is obviously very strong. It made that bit of an awful noise. I don't know if you heard that. Maybe one of the accessories not happy, like power steering or alternator or something. Maybe I'm just gonna have to pop the hood and have a look. But uh, of course I gotta crank the seat heater because I'm gonna go for a drive here in a minute. So full on the seat heater, turn the actual heater on a bit, try and warm it up in here. She's certainly running. Haven't heard any other bad noises. Uh, still has three quarters of a tank of fuel, I see. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm gonna take it for a drive here, give it a bit of a shakedown run. It's gonna be pretty fun, come along, I'll show you what that looks like. Tomorrow. Well, good morning everyone. It is a balmy minus 32 degrees. And uh, I've decided to leave Calgary. I'm headed out, the Rocky Mountains are directly in front of me. And uh, as you can see, I'm driving the Jeep. So last night I took it for a test drive through town. Of course, the GoPro froze again. Uh, I've had it plugged in for hours and hours and because I've been driving an hour already this morning, it's pretty warm inside right now. It must be, I don't know, plus five or something, maybe plus 10. Got the heater absolutely pumping. Um, so hopefully our GoPro keeps going. But today I thought I'll show you the scenery as we drive out into the beautiful Rocky Mountains. There is a lot of snow on the mountains. They kind of look more like a postcard or a painting than real life. And, uh, and I'll tell you some stories. It feels like it's time for a Christmas story. And uh, the one that I had today is lots of people are asking me, why do I live in Canada? Why would I choose Canada when I could be in Australia on the beach right now? I was on the beach the day I flew out getting sunburned, you know, my surfboard's there, my brother's there, he loves surfing. Um, and it's a fair question. And so let's talk about that. Before we do though, I think a bunch of you are curious, how's the Jeep? <laughs> the Jeep is great. It, uh, it definitely didn't love starting in that cold weather, but driving has been absolutely flawless. Um, I'm really surprised actually. It's nicer to drive than I remember. Um, I am talking pretty loudly now to the GoPro. It's really windy outside. I can hear a bit of wind noise. And also once you get above about 80 k's an hour, the engine is quite a bit louder than the Gladiator. Um, and I wonder if part of that would be my mechanical fan that I've added. I should probably take that thing off given that it's winter. But overall, it's smooth, it's nice to drive. It's so much fun driving a manual transmission again. I forgot how much I enjoy it. Uh, when I first got into, I was really shocked that the seat felt really firm and solid and it was a different seating position than I remembered. Of course, that's just because the seat was frozen solid. Now that it's thawed out a bit, I'm kind of sinking into it and it's comfy. Uh, also, it, it was surprising, it was like the seat heater wasn't working very well. Again, that's because it's minus 30. The one in the Gladi only, Gladiator only ever had to contend with plus 10 or something. So uh, it's a bit of a different universe here, but yeah, it's really great to drive. It definitely, I wouldn't say it's gutless compared to the Gladiator. It just drives differently. Part of that'll be because it's a manual transmission. When I'm going up a hill, I have to put my foot down more and more. In fact, right now I have to go for fifth gear. Otherwise, it's just gonna keep slowing down basically. Versus the Gladiator, because it was an auto especially, it would just keep kicking down gears, down, 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 and it would rev harder and harder and harder until you're revving it four and a half thousand RPM to maintain 100 k's an hour which is harder than I would ever rev this engine or really, you know, any manual transmission. But they were just different in that regard. That engine revs hard and that's what the auto transmission does versus now I'm in charge. I'll probably just go a little bit slower, but rev the engine a lot less. But overall, the Jeep from a year and a half in storage, new battery, checked the oil, checked all the fluids, drove it around town for an hour last night 
and now I'm setting out for a seven hour drive, 500 kilometers into the mountain. Um, and it should warm up today. From minus 32, I'm expecting it to get up to about minus 18 or so. I know that still sounds really cold, but it is significantly different. So I'm keeping my eyes, the Jeep has a temperature gauge on the dash. I'm keeping my eyes on it. It says minus 29 right now. As to today's video topic though, why do I choose to live in Canada? Why would I subject myself to this minus 32 nonsense? And in fact, where I used to live in Whitehorse, it's just flat minus 40 this whole week. So Canada's getting a cold snap right now. And uh, when I think about it, there's, there's really two major reasons why I choose to live in Canada. And Katie is now reason number three. Of course, Katie's in Canada. I want to be wherever Katie is, so that's where I'm headed right now, of course. But the two main reasons that have really, really been the core of why I choose to live here for the last 15 years or so, and, and you know, I could choose to live in Australia, New Zealand. I choose to live in Canada. And the first reason is pretty obvious on the surface. It's just how beautiful it is. The insane mountains that I'm driving through, the rivers, the lakes, the wilderness, you know, the wildlife, kind of the beauty that is out here, I personally think surpasses anywhere else I've been on the planet. I am just staggered right now looking at the mountains. I, it doesn't even look real. More than that though, I think, I think it's easy and obvious to say that Canada's beautiful. What I never appreciated before, because when I grew up in Australia, you live in a place where the weather is very stable and very consistent. Lots of people, lots of parts of Australia really only have two seasons. As a joke, people say hot and then hotter. They're the two seasons. And so what that means is wherever you live, whether you're on the beach or whether you're kind of inland or even if you're in the mountains a little bit, you basically live in the same place for the whole year. You, the seasons don't change. And if you want a different season, you have to go somewhere. Maybe you even have to fly overseas. Versus in Canada, when you live, like even where I am right now, it's minus 32 today. Six months from now, it could easily be plus 32, could even be plus 40. And then you actually still live in exactly the same place. You can go anywhere, but now you can go mountain biking. Now you can go out hiking. You can go swimming in the lakes and rivers. We float down one of the rivers up here in inner tubes every summer because it's hot enough. There's swing ropes, we swing out of the trees, all of that kind of stuff. Then, just wait another six months, oh there's a Jeep, I've got a wave, I've got a Jeep wave back. Another six months later, and here it is snowing again, now we can go snowboarding, snowshoeing, ice fishing, all of like the winter activities. And so really, it's like living in two places for the price of one. Without ever having to buy a plane ticket, without ever having to really drive anywhere, you get both of those amazing massive seasons a full summer where you will get sunburn and the sun is up for 18 to 20 hours a day and then a full winter where you've got some of the world's best snowboarding mountains to explore backcountry all of that and you never went anywhere to me having well actually the four seasons i really like fall as well or autumn and spring's always interesting it's kind of a weird transition but some of my favorite days of the year are like the changeovers so it's a real thing in Canada you, you get all excited you, you put your snowboard and all your winter gear away but on that same day you get out your mountain bike and you get out all your hiking gear and so it's fun to although you're saying goodbye to snowboarding for six months you're saying hello to all your summer activities and then it never takes very long and the same thing happens in the opposite direction clean up your mountain bike oil everything grease it put it away in storage and while you're there grab out all your winter gear and your snowboard so that's, that's kind of reason number one, or that is what I think of, and it's the obvious one, the seasons and the beautiful scenery. Reason number two, I think maybe is a little bit less obvious. And it took me, it took me a lot of years of living here to really kind of understand it or really appreciate it. And to describe this, I'm going to generalize a lot. I'm going to generalize about Australians and Australian culture and I'm going to generalize about Canadians and Canadian culture. And, you know, maybe generalizing isn't actually the greatest thing in the world to do, but I think it's kind of useful because generally it's true. That's why it's called a generalization. So the main reason I think the number one that I choose to live in Canada is because the seasons influence the culture, they influence people's attitudes, and for me, the Canadian seasons they influence Canadians in a way that I really love, that I really appreciate. Canadians to me are amazing. 
I mean, not only are they extremely kind, polite, friendly, which is fantastic, that's great, but more than that, the bit that, that really I love is Canadians are go-getters. Canadians absolutely go out and they do stuff, and they do stuff with passion, and they're not the kind of people who are just gonna sit around and wait, or sit around and say, ah, you know, maybe not this weekend. And it took me a lot of years to really put my finger on it, and I do think it's because of the seasons. And, and being back in Australia for that year and a half, I met a whole bunch of Australians, obviously. I went all the way around the country. And there's something, the seasons in Australia, because, well, once when I described it to a friend of mine, I said, yeah, you know, the weather's always amazing. There's no clouds. It's between like 20 and 35 or 40 every day. He said, oh, sounds a bit like Groundhog Day. And I've thought a lot about that. And the thing about Groundhog Day is it just feels so repetitive. Every day is the same. There's no reason to like get after it or take advantage. So my memories of Australia when we were growing up is it would be like a beautiful sunny weekend and you could call up all your buddies and say, hey guys, do you want to go camping this weekend? And everyone would sort of say, eh, we could go next weekend. Which is true because the weather will be just the same next weekend. Same goes if you want to go fishing, if you want to go hiking, if you want to do anything like that. The answer is always, ah, oh, we could do it later. Ah, oh, let's not bother, let's just have a relaxing weekend. Let's sit by the river, let's sit by the lake. Which of course also makes sense because often it's stinking hot. Who wants to go hiking or mountain biking when it's 40 or 45 degrees Celsius? So I think the seasons in Australia lend themselves to like, let's find a shady tree let's have a big cooler full of beer, let's have a really comfortable chair, and that will be our weekend. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy a cold beer as well, but there's kind of not much else to the weekend. I think, generally speaking, that's true in Australia. Of course, it doesn't apply to everyone, it doesn't apply to everywhere, but I think on the whole, that is the culture. Let's relax, let's slow down, let's sit in the shade, take it easy, all of those kinds of things. And people say Australians are really easy going. Again, I think easy going is a bit of a synonym for like relaxed, a synonym maybe for lazy. Maybe Australians have a bit of lazy creeping in. I know I, it's part of who I am inside. I feel that draw to like sit on the couch and do nothing for a day. But anyway, flipping that around, coming to Canada and spending time with Canadians, what I really learned is if someone calls you up and says, hey Dan, let's go camping, like the weather's good on the weekend, Canadians know they need to go camping because in a few more months, it won't be possible. There'll be snow on the ground, feet of snow on the ground, and it'll be minus 32, well, minus 30 right now. So that means Canadians are more motivated to like get after it, like to go for it, to get out and do stuff. And on top of that too, when Canadians go camping, it always impresses me. Of course, people show up with a comfortable chair and a cooler full of beer, that's important. But before the beer comes out, Canadians bring canoes, they bring rock climbing gear, they bring hiking gear, they bring everything you can imagine to be active and to go out and explore and like take advantage of that season that's available to them. I mean, the lake isn't liquid for the whole year. <laughs> Sometimes it's solid ice. So that means while it's liquid, let's take advantage. Let's go canoeing down to the far end of the lake. You know, there's a cool sandbar down there. We can camp. During the days, we can hike way up into the Alpine and find some little Alpine lake and maybe jump in there, even though it's freezing cold. All of those things, Canadians are really excited to go and do. I think because in the back of their mind, they know pretty soon they're not gonna be able to do it. So they kind of have to right now. So it leads to this culture of like, let's go, let's do it, come on. No waiting, no slowing down, no sitting around being lazy. And of course, the exact same true is, is true in winter as well. As soon as there's all this snow on the ground, you start getting phone calls from all these people. Hey Dan, let's go snowboarding. Hey Dan, let's go ice fishing. Let's go snowshoeing. Let's go backcountry skiing. We found a lodge way back in the mountains. We're all gonna ski in there. It'll take us like five hours, drag a toboggan full of gear. Better concentrate here. And uh, let's stay in this backcountry lodge, you know, bring all your camping gear and we sleep inside, but you bring a sleeping bag and all that stuff. And so again, because they know the winter is not gonna last, I mean, the snow's on the ground for, let's say, five or six months. You have to be active and you have to go for it. Take advantage of this epic snow. Go and get some of the best snowboarding on the planet because it's going to end, because it'll be gone and then you won't be able to anymore. 
And so it's amazing that it actually applies in summer and in winter. It gives Canadians this push to like, go for it, to let's go, let's go get it, let's go do it. None of this like, oh yeah, you know, we could do it next weekend. So that's a really long-winded way of saying, I live in Canada, I choose to live in Canada because I really love the Canadian way of life. I love how Canadians are go-getters. I love that they prioritize getting after it. And I think for me and for what I want to do in my life and the kind of people that I want to surround myself with, it just makes me happy. And it just makes me smile and it makes me excited to get up in the morning. Whether it's minus 30 and everything's covered in snow, or whether it's plus 30 and we're gonna go jump in a cold lake, both ways, I wake up with a smile on my face and I say, oh my God, I can't believe where I am. I can't believe we're going to do this crazy adventure. Like, I'm excited, I'm a little bit scared, but I'm excited and I'm like, let's go, this is amazing. That's Canada for me, that's why I'm here, that's why I'm gonna live in Canada for the rest of my life. I love it. I have a lot of adventures around the world that I absolutely wanna go and explore and look at, and learn about, but I think there's a very good chance I will always come back to Canada. So far, it is the best country in the world that I've ever found to live in full time for the rest of my life. Canada's it. So that's it. I hope you're enjoying the scenery. I hope you're enjoying this drive. I'll, uh, I'll keep showing you some beautiful things. There's a big truck and lots of blowing snow in front of me. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for coming along on this ride. It's taken me, I don't even know what I'm up to now, 72 hours, 80 hours from dad's place to eventually I'm gonna get to uh, Katie and my house back home in the mountains. So it's been a long journey. You know, Four wheel drive, it looks a bit slick. It's been a long journey, but it's gonna absolutely be worth it, I'm quite sure. And of course, it's Christmas time too. So I wanna to say to everyone, Merry Christmas. I hope you have a really good family Christmas. Uh, it's been a tough couple of years with COVID and being away from family and friends. So I hope everyone can find a way to surround themselves with their loved ones. And uh, Happy New Year as well. It's always coming faster than you think. And on that note, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break from YouTube. I, uh, I'm really happy with the Australia series. There is of course one more video coming from Australia, the most epic of them all. I have to edit the footage, I'm working on it, it's taking a long time. I'm gonna take a few weeks off though. I need to regroup, I need to spend some time, decompress, and I'm working absolutely on the next vehicle and the next adventure. And I'll come back to you, maybe in early February, I'll come back to you with starting to talk about that and what's involved and how it's all gonna go. It's absolutely going to be the best overland vehicle that I've ever owned. I think in every category, it's a win. So I'm pretty excited about it. There's a lot of irons in the fire. I'm working on things on a lot of different angles. But for now, I'm gonna enjoy a beautiful day in the mountains, driving my favorite Jeep that I can't believe I drove this thing around Africa in plus 45 degrees for years. And now here I am in Canada again, minus 32. <laughs> Same Jeep, more adventures. Yeah, I'm not gonna pop the roof and sleep upstairs tonight. I'm not quite that crazy, but Jeep's running great. It's a beautiful day in the mountains. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks for all the support for the Australian expedition. Thanks for all the kind comments. They really mean a lot to me. Uh, I put a lot of effort and a lot of my heart and soul into this. And so thanks guys, it's been an incredible journey. That is expedition number three in the bag. Mind blowing, I am writing a book about it. It will come, it's a ways away, but it's coming. I've got a ton of magazine articles to write. Still another video for you guys. So much happening. Thank you all so much, I really appreciate it. All the best for 2023. Time is going fast like it always does. What can I say, my usual sign off, have fun out there everyone, and maybe I'll bump into you on the road. So here we are guys, this is the top of Kootenai Pass, and so this is the highest pass, the highest mountain pass in Canada, that's open year round, so it is open in the winter as well. And the sign just went behind that truck. Oh there it is maybe. Uh, yeah, elevation. 5,820 feet, 5,820, which was 1,700 and something meters. So you can see it is full-blown winter up here. 
Snow banks aren't really high yet. It's probably only been maybe two meters of snowfall, maybe three. But uh, this gets the crazy part now. It is down, down, downhill. And uh, this part always unnerves me because when you go downhill, obviously you can't control your speed in the same way. And if you need to just bury the brake pedal but you start sliding, well, then you're in trouble, big trouble. So I'm only in fourth gear right now. I'm currently doing 60 at a bit over 2000 RPM. I'm just gonna see what happens, see how I feel. The surface has been pretty good. I mean, it's full winter. Lots of gravel on the other side, not much gravel on our side right now. But um, they've done a pretty good job plowing and all the trucks have been using chains. So the, the actual snow that I'm driving on isn't smooth. It's very, very corrugated. But uh, I wonder, they maybe help with grip better than if it was just slick. So I'm just touching the brake pedal ever so slightly to stop me accelerating. We're running up towards two and a half thousand RPM, nearly 70 kilometers an hour. And have a look at the view. <laughs> this is why I live in Canada. These are the adventures that I want to have. <laughs> and of course, this early in the season, you can see on the left, there's really no snowbank. So if you start sliding right now, you will go off the side of the mountain and it is a very, very long way down over there. So I'm kind of happy to be over this side right now. Touch that brake pedal again, getting close to 3000 RPM. Minus 24. And of course, because I'm not using the accelerator, the computer isn't injecting any fuel into the engine right now, which means it's not burning anything, which means it's not generating any heat. And it's always fascinating to watch as you come down here the temperature gauge just starts going down and down. So obviously it's closed the thermostat and it's trying to maintain its heat, but without any combustion going on and all this cold air just slamming in the front of the radiator in the engine bay, it just eventually cools down. And I remember my first Jeep I ever owned coming over here, the temperature gauge would almost like rock bottom out. And this is the coldest I've ever been up here at minus 24. So we'll see what this Jeep does today. And this pass too, it's really famous. They, uh, they do a lot of avalanche control here. So I've been watching it because I knew I had to drive over. Two days ago, it closed for about four or five hours. They basically shoot cannons at the mountains and that causes them all to avalanche, which cover the road. And then they spend the next however long plowing and pushing all that snow off the road and then they reopen it again. And they basically do that after every significant snowfall for the entire winter. So usually it's closed for a couple of hours every like three or four or five days, basically just depending on how much it snows. But yeah, they really have to fire rockets at the mountain to make it avalanche. Otherwise the risk is it will avalanche when there's cars and people up here. See everyone's riding their brake on the right way down, trying to not let the speed get away from us. And uh, the surface still is pretty good, so I don't feel too sketched about it. But it never does feel like nice to have to put your foot on the brake when you're coming down a hill like this. If I start sliding, I do not have many options. Best case is take your foot off the brake, stop sliding, and then maybe try again, or maybe steer to a different part of the road and then try again. But of course, with oncoming traffic, that's a thing. And obviously, if you had a choice, you're going to go to the right and go into the ditch. Better than going to the left and either oncoming traffic or off the cliff. But it's one of those not very good uh, choices you don't really want to do either. So slow and steady definitely is the way to go. On the way up, people were basically treating it like a racetrack. I was kind of surprised. I haven't seen that before. But on the way down here, you can see everyone's being pretty sensible and conservative. There's no one overtaking and just going like as fast as your car will roll. In the summer you can do that and you can be doing 140 down here pretty handily. So there we have it. That has been the mighty Kootenai Pass, the mighty drive. Uh, I've been driving for eight and a half hours today and uh, I don't even know what it's been since I left Australia. Four days? Four and a half? I, I've completely lost count. I've had about two days of sleep in that time. So I'm about ready to arrive. These Yokohama tires have certainly done their job. Not once today have I slid or slipped or felt the least bit unconfident. That's been really nice considering I'm a little bit out of practice driving in the snow and in the winter. So there we go. That is just under nine hours of driving. 
and uh, it is very much winter here. I was just in four-wheel drive sliding a little bit going uphill. It's uh, cold and winter and even minus 20. Oh my god, it's been, I don't know, four or five days since I left Australia and I've maybe had one or two nights of sleep. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. This has been epic. I hope everyone has a really Merry Christmas. I'm going to go and see Katie.